Ladies and gentlemen, we are back with another episode of our hit Solve It series, where you will get complete past paper solutions with explanations that a mere mark scheme or examiner report will not give you. It will be a quick revision of the entire syllabus and with a look at the latest paper formats, it will equip you with all that you need to ace your next exam. So without further ado, let's get started. Assalamu alaikum everyone. This is Fahad Ansari and I'm here to help you conquer chemistry once again. Now this time we'll be going with something big. So far in this channel, we've only ever done the Cambridge International AS level papers 1 and 2 and the Cambridge International A level chemistry paper 5. Now this time we're going for the big one, paper 4. This is a two hour long paper, October, November 2023, paper 4 variant 2, 100 marks for this one. It's going to be a marathon but I promise you, you will get a good revision of the entire syllabus and an explanation that no mark scheme or examiner report will provide you and you will be able to gauge just how well you prepared for the exam. So let's get started. All right, so the very first question is about reaction kinetics. So we have this reaction over here and a rate equation for it has been given to us. We have to complete this table with the orders of the reaction. Remember, the order of a reaction is the power to which the concentration of a certain reactant is raised in the rate equation. So if you check out the first reactant, proper known, this is raised to the power of one. All right, so it is first order with respect to proper known. With respect to iodine, you cannot see it in the rate equation anywhere. So that is basically a hidden term which says concentration of iodine to the power of zero. And anything to the power of zero is just one. So it's not there. It doesn't affect the rate of reaction. So we'll write it as zero. For H plus, this is again over here to the power of one. So that's first order. Now overall order of reaction is the sum of the orders of the individual reactants. So we have one plus zero plus one, so that's gonna be two. So it's overall a second order reaction. All right, over here we have an experiment that is performed using large excesses of both propanone and hydrogen ions. And we are recording the concentration of iodine in mole per cubic decimeter with time. All right, now the initial concentration has been given, which is one times 10 to the power of negative five. All right, and we have to draw a graph of the change in concentration with time. So at time zero, it's going to be a cross over here for 1 times 10 to the power of negative 5. That says the initial rate of decrease in the I2 concentration is this much. All right. Now, one thing that you need to remember is that this rate of decrease in the concentration of I2 will remain constant. Right. The reason is that no matter what happens to the concentration of iodine, the rate will not be affected because, as we saw earlier, up here, it's zero order with respect to I2. So the rate will remain constant. It doesn't matter if the concentration of iodine is decreasing. It doesn't affect the rate. So what we will do is we have the initial concentration, 1 times 10 to the power of negative 5. From this, we will subtract the rate of decrease, which is 2.27 into 10 to the power of negative 7. And we will multiply this by 10. And so the answer that we get for the concentration of iodine at 10 seconds is going to be 7.73 times 10 to the power of negative 6. All right. In other words, if you were to convert this into 10 to the power of negative 5, because those are the values given to us, this will turn out to be 0 
times 10 to the power of negative 5. So at 10 seconds, which is all the way over here, we will plot a point for 0 0.70 times 10 to the power of negative 5. And over here we have five small squares, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, between 0 0.7 and 0 0.8. So that means that 0 0.77 will be somewhere between the third and the fourth small square. So I will plot this over here somewhere. All right, actually, somewhere in the middle would be better. So somewhere here is better. All right, so now between them, because again, the rate of decrease is constant, so the gradient is constant. So it has to be a straight line, all right? So I've already drawn a straight line for you so that we don't have to go through that trouble. This is what it should look like at the end of the day. All right. Next it says, state whether it is possible to calculate the numerical value of the rate constant K for this reaction from your graph. If you go back up, to calculate rate constant, we need to know a few things. We need to know the rate of reaction and we need to know the concentrations of the reactants within the rate equation which are propanone and hydrogen ions. The problem is that in this experiment we have been given some large excess of propanone and a large excess of H plus but we don't know any values. So if we don't know any exact values we cannot find the value of K so it's not possible. So what we will write over here is it is not possible to calculate K because no values for the concentrations of propanol and hydrogen ions are given. All right, now moving on to this part over here. A different experiment is carried out. We have the concentrations for all the reactants, which is propanone, H plus, and iodine, even though it doesn't matter for the iodine because it doesn't appear in the rate equation, but still. So the value of K is already given to us. Now we need to calculate the initial rate. This is pretty straightforward. So rate equals K, which is 2.31 times 10 to the power of negative 5 times the concentration of propanone, which is 0 0.200. And for H+, plus, which is again 0 0.200, the concentrations are all the same. Iodine is not in the rate equation, and these two reactants are first order. So we don't need to raise their values to any powers. So once you calculate this, you should get an answer of around 9.24 times 10 to the power of negative 7. All right. Now the next question is about using an excess of H+, plus, right? Now remember when we use an excess of any reactant, um, its concentration barely changes, so it does not have any effect on the rate. So at the end of the day, we're essentially taking it out of the rate equation. And so you're only left with propanone over here. Its concentration will affect the rate significantly. So now the value of K1 over here is given to us. We need to find the value of the half-life. The half-life, remember, is the time taken for the concentration of the reactant to half. Okay. Now, whenever you have an overall first order reaction, this is easy enough to calculate using the value of K. The formula is T half, or half life, equals the natural log of two divided by 1.1 times 10 to the power of negative three. Okay, this is the value of K, the rate constant. The natural log of two can also be remembered as 0 0.693, all right? No need to go into the details of where this formula came from, but it's part of the syllabus, so you need to remember this. All right, so T half is going to be 630 seconds. Right, now we need to draw a graph 
for the concentration of proper known against time. All right. And we're starting off with 0 0.2 mole per cubic decimeter, as was given uh, in the previous part. And we need to go all the way down to 0 0.025. OK. So in order to do this, let's see how many half-lives we require. OK. Starting with the first one. But before we do that, I think it would be better to plot a time axis. All right. But to be honest, I think we could only do that if we know how many half-lives there are. OK. For this, what we will do is that uh, we will have the initial concentration, which is 0 0.2. And we will divide it by 2 times n, where n is going to be the number of half-lives. And this should give us 0 0.025. All right, so when we solve this, it turns out that n equals 3. So there's going to be three half-lives, and each half-life is 630 seconds over here. So 3 times 630, that's about 1890. All right, so let's see how many squares we have. We have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 10. So I think a good enough range to have would be till 2,000 seconds. So start from zero, go all the way to 2,000. And uh, each small square, or actually each large square, which consists of five small squares, will be 200 seconds. So I'll not write all of this here. I'll just skip each large square alternately. And this will be 400, 800, 1,200, and then 1,600. All right, should be good enough. Next, now going from 0 0.2, the first half life will mean we get down to 0 0.1. And the 0 0.1 will be at 630 seconds. So over here, this is 600. Between 600 and 800, there are five small squares, and there's a difference of 200. So 200 seconds divided by 5 small squares. So each small square means 40 seconds. So 600 to 640. So that means that 630 will be close to the first small square, but not exactly on it. So we are at 0 0.1. And this is going to be somewhere over here. All right. Then the next half-life starts from 0 0.1 and ends at 0 0.05. And that will be at 1260, right? So after 1200, one small square is 1240. And then 1260 will be right in the middle of the first and the second small square. So we will place that in the middle. All right. Then finally, we go down from 0 0.05 to 0 0.025, the third half-life. And that will be at 1890 seconds. So this will be 1840, then 1880. So between 1880 and 1920, it will be somewhere in the middle of this small square, but closer to 1880. So let's just draw that a little closer. Should be good to go. All right. Okay, so now through these points, we need to draw a curve, all right? And uh, without wasting any time, I'm just going to show you the curve. And here we go. So we have a nice little curve ready for us, connecting all the points to show a first order reaction with respect to proper known. Let's move on. All right, so we have a suggestion for the mechanism for the overall reaction that we have just been looking at. And as you can notice, there's no step three given. So we need to write an equation for this step. Right. So over here, what we need to do, first of all, is to get rid of any intermediates 
that are present in the other steps. That can get canceled out though, right? So in the first step, we produce this carbocation that gets used up immediately in the next step. So we can cancel this out. All right. Now, H plus over here is being used up in the first step and regenerated in the second step. So these can be canceled out as well. All right. Now what you're left with is a propanone, which is a reactant. And you have this guy over here which is a product. And H plus is also a product in the overall reaction, okay? Now one reactant from the overall equation and one product from the overall equation are missing. And those are iodine and iodide. So we're going to include them in the equation for step three. So you have iodine on the left side and iodide on the right side. Now, they, what will they react with? What will they produce? That is actually decided by the intermediates that are left over. So this over here is an intermediate. It does not feature in the overall equation. So it is produced at step two. You can see it is not being used up in step four, so it must be used up over here in step three. So this is the other reactant. So we have CH3. C, OH double bond CH2. This will react with I2. And uh, we're going to get a new product. Now this new product is going to be this intermediate, this carbocation, which uh, is used up at step four and has not been introduced in any of the earlier steps. So that would be the product of step three. So we will write this as CH3, C plus, bonded to OH in the brackets, CH2I plus iodide. So this is the equation for step three. So just the slowest step of the mechanism. In other words, we are looking for the rate determining step and that needs to mirror the rate equation and that involves one mole of propanone and one mole of H plus. Now, if I remove these crossings out, you will notice that it is in fact step one that includes one mole of propanone and one mole of H plus. And we know they are both first order in the rate equation. And so this is going to be step one. So the other reason why it is step one, you need to write that down because one mole of propanone and hydrogen ions react in this step and uh, the reaction is first order with respect to each of them. All right, now the last part identify one conjugate acid conjugate base pair now this is very straightforward because over here now except for step three each of these other steps involves a transfer of a proton in some way shape or form in step one you can see that propanone is accepting this proton over here so the base is going to be propanone itself. It's going to be CH3, CO, CH3. And the base, which is propanone, once it has accepted H+, it's going to turn into its conjugate acid. Now it is able to donate that same proton. And that's on the right-hand side. That conjugate acid is going to be CH3, C+, OH in the brackets, and then CH3. Similarly, over here in step two, this is an acid and it donates this proton over here. So this becomes a base. And then in step four, this over here is an acid. Once it donates this proton over here, what you're left behind with is a base. So you have three conjugate acid base pairs to choose from. I just chose the easiest one, which is in step one. 
All right, question number two. So we have been given a situation where we have a buffer solution made of one gram of benzoic acid and a slightly greater mass of sodium benzoate, a salt of that weak acid. And this is a one cubic decimeter buffer solution. And the pH has also been given. Now, first of all, it asks for the definition of a buffer solution. This should be very straightforward. It is a solution that resists changes in pH with small amounts of acid or alkali are added. So that's the definition of a buffer solution. Simple as that. Now we have to write equations to show how exactly those pH changes are resisted. So first of all, we add a few drops of aqueous sodium hydroxide. Now amongst these two uh, mixtures, amongst these two substances of the mixture, uh, benzoic acid and sodium benzoate, of course it's the benzoic acid that will neutralize the sodium hydroxide. So you write benzoic acid, C6H5COOH, plus NaOH. So this is going to give us a salt and water. The salt happens to be sodium benzoate and we get water. Now when we add nitric acid, of course it's the sodium benzoate that is going to neutralize it because sodium benzoate contains an anion that is the conjugate base of benzoic acid and it can accept a proton easily. So we will write this over here. We have sodium benzoate, C6H5COONA, plus HNO3, the nitric acid. So this will give us uh, benzoic acid. This is C6H5COOH, because the benzoate ion over here accepted the H plus from the nitric acid and the other ions will make the byproduct sodium nitrate. So this is how a buffer solution behaves and acts to neutralize any foreign influences. A robust defense system. All right. Now over here, we need to calculate certain concentrations of the components within this buffer solution. And we'll need to use the data from above. So the first thing that we need is the concentration of H+. Plus. Go upstairs. It says the buffer solution has a pH of 4.15. So for this, it's pretty straightforward. If you have pH, how do you convert it into concentration of H+, plus? that will be 10 to the power of negative pH, negative 4.15 in this case. And the answer happens to be 7.08 times 10 to the power of negative 5. Remember the answer is required in three significant figures. It's given in the question, so there should be no doubt about it. Right, the next thing that we asked for is the concentration of benzoic acid. Now, if you go up again, it says over here that for benzoic acid, we have exactly 1.00 grams that are dissolved in 1.00 cubic decimeter. Now we need to convert this gram per cubic decimeter concentration into mole per cubic decimeter by dividing the mass by the moles. So the concentration of benzoic acid, C6H5COOH. So we divide the one gram by the MR. For the MR, we need to add up everything in the molecule. So we have the ARs. There are seven carbon atoms, so seven times 12, plus we have six hydrogen, so that's six, plus two oxygen, so that's two times 16. And we divide all of this by the one cubic decimeter, the volume of the solution. So once we do all of this, the answer turns out to be 8.20 into 10 to the power of minus three. All right, 
So let me write that a little bit clearly. Negative sign seems to have vanished. It's going to be negative 3 over here. Right. Now for the sodium benzoate. All right. Now, this one's a little tricky because we don't know the exact mass. It says slightly greater mass than the benzoic acid, but we don't know exactly how much that is. So to calculate it, what we will do is we'll use the Ka expression. The Ka expression is the concentration of hydrogen ions times the concentration of the conjugate base of our weak acid. And we all know that the conjugate base is coming from the salt. So we will write the concentration of the salt. And this will be divided by the concentration of the weak acid itself, that is dissociated. Now the value of the Ka that is given to us, it is 6.31 into 10 to the power of negative 5. So we will write that down. So it's 6.31 into 10 to the power of negative 5. And uh, now the concentration of H+, plus, which is calculated over here. Okay. So I'll just write that down. 7.08 into 10 to the power of negative 5 times X, which is the unknown concentration of salt, divided by the concentration of the acid, which we calculated, which is 8.20 into 10 to the power of negative 3. Now... I'm writing these rounded answers in the working, even though when you actually do the working in your calculator, it's better to use the exact answers that are stored, right? So over here in this step, if you need to calculate 10 to the power of negative 4.15 again, you do that. And if you need to do the entire calculation for the concentration of the acid over here, the one divided by the MR, divided by one again, you do that in the denominator, and that's how you could get a better, more accurate answer. So once you do all of this, once I did all of this, I got an answer of 7.31 times 10 to the power of negative three. All right, so this is how we have to calculate these concentrations. Very um, straightforward question on buffer solutions. All right, so over here it says that we mix some of the buffer solution with some potassium hydroxide, a strong base. Now, we allow the reaction to occur without stirring and we have two observations. First of all, the temperature is fractionally above 298 Kelvin. So when the temperature increases in the reaction, we know that it is exothermic, right? And we need to explain this observation so we will write that the neutralization reaction between KOH and benzoic acid is exothermic. That is why the temperature is above 298 Kelvin. Then the pH after the reaction is greater than 13. Now the reason why that is is because all the benzoic acid eventually reacts and you have some leftover excess KOH. So you write that down over here. So you will write that uh, the benzoic acid has completely reacted and there is excess KOH causing a high pH. All right, so this is how you explain what's going on. Now, the next part is about Ksp, another equilibrium constant. So now we have been given the equilibrium constant for magnesium benzoate. And uh, over here we have the Ksp expression given to us and the value as well. So now we need to calculate the solubility of magnesium benzoate and give the answer in gram per cubic decimeter. Okay, so for this, 
first of all, let's write the equation for the dissociation of a magnesium benzoate. So this is C6H5, COO twice. All right. When this dissociates, you get magnesium ions and you get two moles of the benzoate ion, C6H5, COO minus. Now, if the concentration of the dissolved magnesium benzoate happens to be X, then because of the one-to-one -one ratio between magnesium benzoate and magnesium ions, the concentration of magnesium ions will also be X, and the concentration of the benzoate ions will be 2x because we have a 1 to 2 ratio between the salt and the benzoate ions, right? Now we have expressions in terms of x for the two ions concentrations. So we now plug them into the KSP. KSP is 1.76 times 10 to the power of negative 7. So you have concentration of Mg2 plus over here. That will be x. And then we have the concentration of the benzoate ion squared because there's two of them in the dissociation. So that's going to be 2x and that itself will be squared. And this will become 4x cubed. So now that you do this and you solve for x, that will give us the uh, solubility of magnesium benzoate in mole per cubic deciliter. So once you solve this for x, you should get 3.53 times 10 to the power of negative 3. This is in mole per cubic decimeter. Now in order to convert this into gram per cubic decimeter, we know that we need to multiply by the MR. The MR is already given to us, so we will multiply this by 266.3 grams per mole. So mole and mole cancel out over here. And this will become gram per cubic decimeter as the unit suggest over here. And so the final answer will be 0 0.940. All right. Now the next question says that we are adding some magnesium benzoate to a sample of magnesium sulfate. All right. Remember that uh, in the sulfates, magnesium sulfate is actually pretty soluble. All right. And you can notice that uh, we have a common ion between the magnesium benzoate and the magnesium sulfate. And if we are mixing in a soluble salt in a mixture of an insoluble salt, and you already have a saturated solution of it, then in that situation, the solubility will decrease and you will get some precipitate of magnesium benzoate, the insoluble salt because of what is known as the common ion effect, right? If I look back at this reversible reaction, if I were to increase the concentration of magnesium ions from magnesium sulfate, this would increase. And according to Le Chatelier's principle, if I want to break this back down, if I want to oppose this change, I will shift it to the left-hand side. Remember on the left-hand side, you have a solid. And these are the aqueous ions on the right-hand side. So... The presence of the common ion, the magnesium ion, means that more precipitate will be formed, the solubility decreases. So the concentration is going to be lower than the concentration that we calculated in part one. And the explanation, well, you don't need to go into all the detail that I just gave you because this is only a one mark question. So you just write common ion effect. That will suffice. All right, so question number three. We have some electrode potentials given to us. Now we need to complete the diagram to show a standard hydrogen electrode. We need to label the diagram and identify all the substances present, but we do not need to state standard conditions. So that's a good thing. It's only a one mark question, so um, shouldn't need to do so much. All right, so in a standard hydrogen electrode, you guys need to remember that uh, because hydrogen gas is in contact with H plus ions in solution, so the electrode will be an inert electrode, and we will go for platinum. 
right? This will be a platinum electrode. That is what we will dip into a solution. And the solution will contain H plus ions. So this could be an acid, all right? And uh, on the surface of the platinum, we need to have the gas coming into contact with the ions. So we will have a gas delivery system, all right? A gas inlet that is closed from the top and has hydrogen coming in from one side. So this is hydrogen gas coming in. And this is our gas inlet or gas delivery system. And of course, this is the wire that will connect to the rest of the circuit, to the remaining half cell. So that's going to be your standard hydrogen electrode. All right, so the next part asks us about connecting an Fe3 plus, Fe2 plus electrode and a standard hydrogen electrode. Now for this, we need to figure out um, which one is the positive electrode and what is the direction of flow of electrons. So remember that for the standard hydrogen electrode for the um, H plus and H2 half cell, the standard electrode potential value that we give for this is zero volts, right? Now if you look up in the table, Fe3 plus and Fe2 plus, this is the half equation. We have Fe3 plus being reduced to Fe2 plus in the forward reaction, and the electrode potential is 0 0.77. So you can see over here that it is a higher electrode potential or higher reduction potential, so Fe3 plus will be reduced. Electrons will be gained by this half cell. And whichever half cell or electrode gains electrons, that is going to be the positive electrode. So this is going to be the Fe3 plus, Fe2 plus electrode. And the electrons are going to flow from, of course, the hydrogen electrode, H2 and H plus electrode. I'll write it like this. And we will go from the hydrogen electrode that loses electrons to the iron electrode, the Fe3 plus, Fe2 plus. That is where electrons are being gained. And that is the positive electrode. That is where reduction will happen. All right, let me rewrite this. Normally write the species that is on the left-hand side first, followed by the species on the right-hand side after reduction occurs. And that's how we name the half cells. All right, so this is how we do this one. All right, so over here we have some vanadium containing species and uh, we need to identify one vanadium containing species that does not react with the Fe2 plus ions under standard conditions. All right, let's take a look. All right, so over here we have one half equation that involves Fe2 plus, all right? And uh, let's say that uh, for the species that may not react with Fe2+, let's go with, let's say, V3+, right? Let's do a comparison with V3+, all right? So Fe2+, um, if it were to react, it would need to be oxidized. So in other words, V3+, would need to be reduced. And for V3 plus to be reduced, the electrode potential needs to be higher than 0 0.77. It needs to be more positive. So now the only half equation where V3 plus is being reduced right here, V3 plus being reduced over here, involves an electrode potential that is much lower, much more negative. So reduction will not be favored. So it does not react. Now there's a half equation in which Fe2 plus is being reduced, which is this one. So for Fe2 plus to be reduced, I want its electrode potential of negative 0.44 to be more positive or less negative than the electrode potential for the V3 plus half equation where V3 plus needs to be 
oxidized. Now the half equation in which V3 plus is oxidized is this one. The problem is that the electrode potential is not more negative, it is more positive. So if it's more positive, instead of oxidation, you would have reduction happening. So again, V3 plus is not reacting with Fe2 plus in either case, right? Whether it is to oxidize Fe2 plus or to reduce it, it doesn't work. So how will we write this answer? All right, so what species is V3 plus? All right, now how do we explain this? We will say that um, in the situation of where we want the Fe2 plus to be oxidized, the V3 plus half equation where it is being reduced does not have a more positive E standard. It's more negative. So we can write that the E standard is less positive than plus 0 0.77 volts we will write this as minus 0.26 volts. That is the electrode potential value that we were currently considering, this one. All right. And in the case where Fe2 plus is being reduced, we want V3 plus to be oxidized. So we want V3 plus to be more negative than the Fe2 plus electrode potential. But over here it is not more negative, it's less negative. So we will say that. And it is less negative than the electrode potential where Fe2 plus needs to be reduced. And that is minus 0 0.44 volts. It's less negative than that. And the value that we are comparing is plus 0 0.34 volts. All right. So whenever you answer questions like this, you need to be sure to quote the electrode potential values, otherwise there might be a problem. Now it says identify all the vanadium containing species that will react with Fe2 plus ions under standard conditions. All right. Okay, so let me just get rid of all of this. Because I want to make new fresh comparisons. I don't want it to become a mess over here. All right. So one species that we know for sure um, that is going to react with Fe2 plus actually happens to be over here, the vanadium. All right. Reason is that the vanadium can be oxidized to V2 plus with a more negative electrode potential and Fe2 plus over here can be reduced with a more positive electrode potential. All right, so V, plus, v over here being oxidized to V2 plus, that is one vanadium containing species that will definitely react. So I'm going to write this down over here. In fact, for the equation for one of the possible reactions identified in part two, um, I will write the half equation for vanadium and for iron. Over here, we know that vanadium is being oxidized, iron two is being reduced. They have the same number of electrons, so these can be canceled out. And this half equation needs to be reversed, right? So now what we will do is, we know that vanadium is being oxidized by reacting with Fe2 plus. So Fe2 plus will be reduced to Fe and vanadium will be oxidized to V2 plus. Right. Now there's another species over here that uh, does react with Fe2 plus. All right. And that involves the situation where Fe2 plus will be oxidized to Fe3 plus with a um, less positive electrode potential. And that so happens to be in this half equation where you have 
VO2 with a positive charge that is going to be reduced because it has a more positive electrode potential than 0.77 volts. So VO2 with a positive charge that is going to be reduced while Fe2 plus is oxidized to Fe3 plus. So we write this as VO2 with a plus charge. All right. Now, how do I know that these are the only two? Because if you notice, uh, this half equation is the only one which has an electrode potential which is more positive than 0.77 volts. Amongst all the vanadium containing half equations, it's the only one that is more positive than 0.77. So Fe2 plus can be oxidized in peace. And this one over here is more negative then minus 0 0.44 where the Fe2 plus can be reduced and the vanadium containing species on the right hand side of this can be oxidized because it fits more negative electrode potential. All right, so those are the only two species that will react with Fe2 plus. All right, now we have another electrochemical cell with Fe3 plus and Fe2 plus and ClO minus and Cl minus in alkaline conditions that is set up. Now we have the half cell of Fe3 plus Fe2 plus where the concentration of Fe3 plus is a thousand times greater than the concentration of Fe2 plus. All right, and all other conditions are standard. We need to use the Nernst equation to calculate the E value, right? So the Nernst equation involves the non-standard electrode potential that equals the standard value, all right? So in this situation, that's going to be plus 0.77, all right, for the Fe3 plus, Fe2 plus. If you go up here, that's the value that we've been talking about for so long. And plus, we're going to have 0.059, it's a part of the equation, divided by Z, which is the number of electrodes in the half equation, we know that Fe3 plus being reduced to Fe2 plus involves only one electron being gained, so Z equals 1. So then we have the log of the concentration of the species with the higher oxidation number, in this case that is Fe3 plus. Now we know that Fe3 plus concentration is a thousand times greater than the concentration of Fe2 plus. So if Fe2 plus concentration is X, then Fe3 plus will be a thousand X. And this is the 1000x that comes up in the numerator and x in the denominator, right? So you cancel out the x's, all right? And so when you calculate the answer, 0 0.947 volts with a positive sign. Now we need to write an equation for the reaction that occurs under these conditions. So remember this electropotential we will be using it. So instead of plus 0 0.77, we're going to be going with plus 0 0.947 volts. All right. And for the other half cell, this is the half equation. Plus 0 0.89 is its standard electrode potential. This is less positive, And so oxidation will occur over here. And in the case of the Fe3 plus Fe2 plus half cell, now we're going to be dealing with reduction. So reduction occurs over here, oxidation occurs in the ClO minus slash Cl minus half cell. Now to balance out the electrons, we need to multiply this half equation by 2 to cancel them out, and we need to flip this particular half equation. All right, so if we go back down to the answer space, we know that 2 Fe3 plus are going to be reduced. This is going to happen with the help of Cl minus and OH minus. So this becomes 2 Fe2 plus and the Cl minus will be oxidized to ClO minus. And the other product of this reaction is going to be H2O there's actually two OH minus, so we should go back and correct that. It's going to be two OH minus and H2O as the other product of this reaction. Right. 
Now we have another electrochemical cell. Now this time, be very careful. They have changed the iron electrode instead of Fe3 plus Fe2 plus. Now you have Fe2 plus slash Fe. And we have the same other electrodes, CLO minus and Cl minus. Now we need to calculate the value of delta G. Okay. So the formula for delta G in this situation under standard conditions is minus N times F times E cell. So over here, N is basically the number of electrons involved in the overall equation. So if we go back up and look at those half equations that we're dealing with, So we have the Fe2 plus Fe half equation. And uh, over here we have two electrons. And over here we have two electrons. So N equals 2. Now this is minus 0 0.44. And this is plus 0 0.89. So we know that CLO minus will be reduced. And uh, Fe is going to be oxidized. All right. So in this situation, this will be E reduced, which is plus 0 0.89, and this is going to be E oxidized, which is minus 0 0.44. So that will be helpful in calculating the E cell. So N was 2 because there's two electrons involved. F is Faraday's constant, that is 96,500. The value is given at the end of the paper. I'm not going to scroll that far though. And E reduced minus, and then E oxidized, which is minus 0 0.44. All right. Now, remember that this formula gives you the answer in joules per mole, right? And we want the answer, the final answer, in kilojoules per mole. So, after all this is said and done, we're going to convert this by dividing by 1,000. And then the final answer turns out to be minus 257 kilojoules per mole. All right, now in this question, we have an electrolysis going on for iron 2 sulfate, and it is done using iron electrodes. And under the conditions used, no gas is involved at the cathode. That means no hydrogen is produced. So we are going to assume that iron is going to be produced. So FeSO4, iron 2 sulfate, so that means that Fe2 plus is being reduced at the cathode to give us iron metal. All right, it says so that the mass of the cathode increases by 0 0.185 grams, so that is the mass of iron that is being deposited, okay? So whenever we have any question about the products of electrolysis and the amount produced, uh, the formula is pretty straightforward. Over here we have the formula of the product, in this case iron, moles of iron, equals we have total charge, which is current multiplied by time, IT, divided by NE, which is basically the moles of electrons per mole of product. In this situation, for one mole of iron, we have two moles of electrons. So NE will be two in this situation. Times, now, normally we have Faraday's constant here, but because we know that Faraday's constant equals Avogadro's constant times elementary charge so we're going to write it like that we're going to write l for avogadro's constant and e for the charge on one electron all right so now i'm going to move a couple of things around moles of fe and avogadro's constant will switch places so i will write l equals it now current is 0 0.64 and time is 17 minutes we need to convert the time from minutes to seconds, so this will become 70.0 times 60 for the time, divided by Ne, which is 2, as we already discussed. Moles of iron, well, we have the mass over here. Divide this mass by the AR of iron, which is 55.8, if you want to check out the periodic table, times E. Now, this value will also be given to you just before the periodic table at the end but I remember the value, so I don't need to check. Let's 
it's going to be 1.6 times 10 to the power of negative 19. And uh, once you do all this calculation in one fell swoop, you will get L. Now, normally, mark schemes, they have a step-by-step -step procedure for calculating Avogadro's constant experimentally, but you can get all three marks just by doing this one step. All right? And I prefer to reduce the number of steps so that it's easier to implement. So the answer turns out to be 6.15 times 10 to the power of 23. All right. And normally in such questions, whenever you get 6 point something times 10 to the power of 23, the answer should be good enough, right? It's the 10 to the power of 23 part that is most important. And the number before that should be close enough to 6. Right. Now the next part is about... Gibbs free energy change once again, but this time, instead of using E cell, we're going to be using delta H and delta S, the enthalpy and entropy changes. So first of all, we have the equation and we need to calculate entropy change, delta S. So we know that we're going to first add up the entropies of the product. So over here we have FeCl3, and there's two moles of it. So this is going to be two times 142 for the product. And then subtract from that the sum of entropies of the reactants. So that's going to be FeCl2, and there's two moles of it, so 2 times 120 plus Cl2. So there's only one mole of it, so don't need to multiply this by anything. So when you calculate all of this, this is going to become minus 179 and the units for entropy joule per kelvin per mole then we have gibbs free energy now remember this is to calculate delta g standard all right and for standard delta g what we're going to do is we're going to use t the temperature at 298 kelvin so delta h is minus 128 it is given all the way up here minus T, which is 298, times delta S, which is minus 179. Now remember that delta H is in kilojoules per mole, and the delta S is in joule per Kelvin per mole. So in order to make units consistent, I'm going to divide the delta S by 1000 to convert it into kilojoules per Kelvin per mole. So once I do this, once I've implemented the equation of delta H minus T delta S, the answer turns out to be minus 74.7 kilojoules per mole. All right, now we need to predict whether the reaction becomes more or less feasible at a higher temperature. So if you look closely over here, delta S is negative and delta H is also negative. So if I look at the equation for delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. So I know that delta S over here is negative. So minus T delta S, this entire thing will become positive. And I know that delta H is also negative. Now when the temperature rises, the positive value will increase. So when you're adding a larger positive number to a negative number that's constant for delta H, eventually you, there will come a point where delta G becomes zero and then greater than zero. And this is with increasing temperature. So that means the reaction will become less feasible because minus T delta S becomes more positive And when that happens, delta G becomes more positive. And when delta G is more positive, that means it's becoming less and less feasible. All right, remember feasibility means that the reaction can continue without a constant supply of energy. That's a feasible or spontaneous reaction. If it becomes less feasible, that means at a certain point you will need to 
provide a certain amount of energy continuously for the reaction to continue. All right. All right, onward to question four. We have a polydentate ligand, EDTA4 minus, and we have some uh, stability constants for complexes involving this EDTA4 minus. So first things first, what is a stability constant? So for this definition, it is the equilibrium constant for the formation of a complex from its constituent metal atom or ion and ligands in solution. All right. So we will see how this works in a later part of the same question. Over here, we need to calculate the oxidation states of the two transition element ions. We know that EDTA is 4 minus, this is minus 4. Copper is X, so when you add these up, you should get the charge on the complex ion, which is minus 2. So when you solve this, this becomes plus 2. Do a similar thing over here, and chromium will be plus 3, right? Plus 3 for the chromium. And then minus 4 for the EDTA should give you minus 1 overall. Reduce the number of load pairs donated by each EDTA4 minus ligand in the single complex ion. Now, this is part of the syllabus. You should actually know the number of load pairs for EDTA4 minus. Remember that EDTA4 minus is actually hexadentate. In other words, it forms six dative covalent bonds with the central metal atom or ion so this is going to be six and just to identify what those atoms are basically you have these four oxygen atoms which are negatively charged on all of these ends these will donate their lone pairs one each and the two nitrogens will also donate one electron pair each so six atoms six lone pairs in total Identify the most stable complex. All right, so over here, remember the higher the case stab or stability constant, the more stable the complex is. So over here, look for the highest power of 10. This is over here, 10 to the power of 25. So that is Fe EDTA minus. So if we write that down, we have Fe EDTA in brackets minus. And the reason is it has the highest case stab value. All right. Now we will actually get to use a case stab expression for this particular question. All right. So over here we have uh, Cu H2O6 2 plus concentration and the concentration of the EDTA4 minus ligand and from these ions we're going to be making Cu EDTA 2 minus right so the equation for this will look something like this you have Cu H2O6 with the 2 plus charge all right so we normally take the hydrated uh, complex as the starting point for the formation of any other complex for when we consider the case stab expression this will react with EDTA or minus and that will give us Cu EDTA with a 2 minus charge and all six water molecules have been removed they have been replaced this is a ligand substitution reaction. Right, so now for this particular equilibrium, this should be a reversible reaction. For this equilibrium, we need to write a Kc expression that will be the case step. So the case step is going to be Cu EDTA 
and you have a two minus charge. We have adding extra square brackets for the concentration. This is in the numerator. Remember, we're not going to include water over here because that's the solvent. We don't have a concentration for solvent, only for solutes. In the denominator, we will have the concentration of the hydrated copper two complex, CuH2O6, with a two plus charge. Again, extra square brackets for the concentration times the concentration of EDTA or minus. All right. Now over here, the case tab value will be given the table above. Cu EDTA two minus that's six point three one into ten to the power of nineteen. All right. We will go for. 6.31 into 10 to the power of 19. For Cu EDTA with a 2 minus charge, that is what we need to calculate. That's going to be X. In the denominator, we have the concentration of the hydrated copper 2 complex, which is 3.00 times 10 to the power of negative 10. And for EDTA for minus, that will be 5.00 into 10 to the power of negative 12. All right, so the answer turns out to be 0.0947 mole per cubic decimeter. Right, so now we have a solution of Cu EDTA2 minus, which is pale blue. The solution of this is deep blue. All right, now what's the difference? Obviously, the difference is in the ligands, right? Now, what do the ligands have to do with all of this? So when we explain this, we will write that the different ligands in the two complexes cause them to have different values for energy difference between the two sets of non-degenerate d orbitals because remember over here when we have a different energy level for the two sets of non-degenerate d orbitals there's an energy difference an electron will be promoted or excited by the absorption of a certain frequency of visible light now when the delta e value between the two sets of non-degenerate orbitals is different for different complexes that a different frequency of light will be absorbed and so a different frequency of light will be reflected back so we complete this answer by writing so different frequencies of light will be absorbed for electron excitation And thus, different frequencies of light will be reflected back. All right, now I understand that a lot of you may not have the space to write all that answer. So you can just write the answer up until this point. These are just some additional details just to make the answer sound more well-rounded, okay? All right, so this was it for question four. We have four more questions to go. Let's continue. All right, so we have a thermal decomposition question over here, and it describes that we have magnesium ethane dioate which decomposes to give us magnesium oxide that is one of the products and a mixture of two different gases one of which gives a white precipitate with saturated calcium hydroxide solution so we know that one of the gases is going to be carbon dioxide in simple terms it turns lime water milky right so we're going to write down these products we have mgo magnesium oxide carbon dioxide and if we try to balance the equation we have one carbon and one oxygen remaining so the other gas has to be carbon monoxide all right 
It says which of these two, magnesium or calcium ethane dioate, undergoes thermal decomposition at a lower temperature. All right. So we're going to apply the same reasoning that we do for the thermal stability of carbonates and nitrates. Right. So we know that thermal stability increases down the group. So that means magnesium ethane dioate, which is belonging to metal further up the group, is going to be less stable. It will decompose at a lower temperature, right? So I'm going to say that magnesium ethane dioate decomposes at a lower temperature because the cation has a smaller ionic radius resulting in a higher charge density and when you have a higher charge density that polarizes the anion more making the ethane dioate ion more polarized and the bonds within it become weaker and less energy is required to break them. So that is why magnesium ethane dioate is less thermally stable. All right. So now we have some moles to do over here. We have a reaction between ethane dioate ions and manganate 7. All right. And this is to find the solubility of magnesium ethane dioate in water because it's only partially soluble, right? So we have a saturated solution of magnesium ethane dioate, and this requires 37.05 cubic centimeters of 0 0.002 mole per cubic decimeter KMnO4, right? So from this information of volume and concentration, we can easily find the moles of the manganate ion. So that's what I'm going to do first. So this is going to be... 27.05, remember to convert this into cubic decimeters, times, we have the concentration, 0 0.002, 00, and this will give us approximately 5.41 times 10 to the power of negative 5 moles, right? Now from this, we want to find out the moles of the ethane dioate ions that are present in the magnesium ethane dioate. So over here, you can see that this is a ratio of 5 to 2, right? So basically, if I have the ratio over here of ethane dioate to manganate 7, 5 moles of ethane dioate react with 2 moles of manganate 7. I have the moles of manganate 7, which is 5.41 into 10 to the power of negative 5. And so I need to find the moles of ethane dioate. All right. So when I cross multiply this, I should get an answer of the number of moles of ethane dioate C2O4 to minus. And that should be 1.3525 times 10 to the power of negative 4 moles. Now, obviously, we know that the moles of ethane dioate will be equal to the moles of magnesium ethane dioate because each uh, magnesium ethane dioate contains one C2O4 to minus, right? So this will be equal to moles of the magnesium ethane dioate. All right. Now we need to find out the concentration. And for this... We have the volume of the sample, which is 40 cubic centimeters. So now we're going to divide the moles that we just found by the volume. So concentration of magnesium ethane dioate, that's going to be 1.3525 times 10 to the power of negative 4 divided by 40 divided by 1000. Remember to convert cubic centimeters to cubic decimeters. And once we finally do all of this, the answer turns out to be 3.38 times 10 to the power of negative 3. Remember, uh, you look at the significant figures in the data. The least number of significant figures will be 
the number of significant figures in the answer. Over here, you can see there are three significant figures. Over here, we have four, so that's a little more. And in the concentration, that's three again. So the least number of significant figures in the data is three, so the answer should also be to a minimum of three significant figures. All right. Okay, moving on. All right, so we have uh, phosphate and carbon monoxide given to us, and they are monodentate ligands in some complexes, and we need to define the term monodentate ligand. All right, so a monodentate ligand is basically a molecule or ion that donates one lone pair to a central metal atom or ion in a complex, right? In other words, it forms one dative covalent bond with that central metal atom or ion. Define transition element complex, all right? So now that's the natural next question. It is a molecule or ion that is formed by a central transition element because they asked for a transition element complex, right? Transition element atom or ion bonded coordinately, that's basically dative covalent bonds, with several ligands, all right? Explain why transition elements form complexes. That is simple enough. A lot of the properties of transition elements are because of the presence of d orbitals. And these d orbitals need to be vacant and these need to be energetically accessible. What that means is there shouldn't be too much of an energy requirement to form bonds with the uh, transition element atoms or ions with those d orbitals involved. So we're going to say that it contains vacant and energetically accessible d orbitals. All right. Now over here we have a table of certain complexes and uh, we need to basically fill in the geometry or shape of uh, these three complexes first all right now it says that each complex is either going to be square planar tetrahedral or octahedral okay now over here they've given some information above i will refer to this information as i do this question so i have rh at the center en2 now en over here this is one two diamino ethane remember that this is a bidentate ligand so that's two of them so two times two so that's four bonds with the en molecules and then chloride is monodentate you should know this so that is six coordinate bonds in this complex coordination number six when that happens you should know that it's going to be octahedral then we have this over here now carbon monoxide they already told us at the beginning of the question that this is monodentate and there's two of them so two coordinate bonds here two for the chloride so that's four now with the coordination number four it could either be square planar or tetrahedral but the thing is that it shows isomerism remember that out of these two shapes only square planar complexes show isomerism right tetrahedral complexes do not so we are going to write this as square planar And finally, over here, we have uh, AU that is bonded to di-N. Now, di-N over here is this tridentate ligand. All right. It's tridentate, so that means three dative covalent bonds. So that's going to be three plus... Oh, excuse me. I'm writing it for the wrong one. It's going to be three for the di-N over here. Plus, we have two water molecules. Again, they're monodentate. You should know this. 
and chloride is also monodentate, so that's six coordination number, and so we will have an octahedral complex once again. All right, now we need to write an equation using the complex that we just looked at and the complex that I was about to look at. All right, now if you notice, the difference between them is that over here, the first complex, I have two water molecules and one chloride ion in the ligands. And over here, I have three chloride ions and no water molecules. So that means that two water molecules have been swapped out for two chloride ions. So that is a ligand substitution. So I'm going to write it as such. That's going to be Au di N H2O2 Cl. And that has a two positive charge and we're going to react this with two chloride ions that are going to swap out the two water molecules so they are kicked out and you're going to have the new complex which is au di n cl3 so that is our ligand substitution All right, now we have to draw the structure of Au di NCl3. If you look back up at the table, this is octahedral. All right, so what I'm going to do is I have two bonds in the same plane as the screen. I'm going to draw two more like that. And there's going to be one bond coming out of the screen with a solid triangular wedge and one bond that goes into the screen away from us. All right, now this tridentate ligand di N we have three nitrogens and we're going to connect them with these uh, curly lines. And it says about this that uh, the three bonds in the di end ligand, they all lie in the same plane, right? So what that means is that I need to attach these three nitrogen atoms to three bonds lying in the same plane as the screen. That's how I'm gonna do it. So what I will do so I will have N, N, and N, all in the same plane, and I will connect them with those curved lines. All right. Now I have CLs to place everywhere else, so I'm going to have a CL here, here, and here, and that should do it. Now I need to draw a structure for this complex. All right. And if I look up, this particular complex over here shows no isomerism. So that means over here, pH3, we were already told that this is going to be monodentate. So that's two bonds, and two chloride ions, and two more bonds. So that's a coordination number of four. And because it shows no isomerism, it's going to be tetrahedral. It's not going to be square planar. So two bonds at the same screen at this angle, one bond coming out, one bond going in, and I can place the ligands wherever I want. So I'm going to place the pH3 molecules over here and the CLs over here, right? Now it says that one of these two complexes can exist in three isomeric forms, right? Now for this one, if you recall, we said that this was square planar. Now the thing is that for square planar, the only type of isomerism that we can have is cis -trouts. And when you have only cis isomerism, that means that you can only have two isomers, not three. But for this one over here, this is octahedral. And for octahedral complexes, you can have both cis and optical isomerism occurring at the same time. And so what happens essentially is that you have a cis isomer and a trans isomer. The trans isomer will not have any optical isomers, but the cis isomer will have an optical isomer. So we will count the cis isomer plus its non-superimposable mirror image. And so this is the complex that we will go for. So that's RHEN2Cl2 with a positive charge. And the types of isomerism are both geometrical or you could say cis and optical.
All right, so now we have a new complex to draw. So this is nickel in the center, two water molecules and four ammonia molecules. So those are six monodentate ligands. It's going to be an octahedral shape. Now, previously when we drew an octahedral shape, if you go back up, this is what we came up with, right? Four bonds in the same plane, one coming forward and one going backward. But another way to draw the uh, octahedral structure is that you draw two bonds in the same plane, two bonds coming forward, and two bonds going backward. So this is also another acceptable way of drawing an octahedral complex. Now over here we have to draw the isomers of this. Now because you have two water molecules, two monodentate ligands, and the rest of them are ammonia molecules. So when you have two monodentate ligands that are the same as each other, uh, the type of isomerism that you will go for is geometrical or cis-trans isomerism. So first let's draw the cis. So water, I will place one over here and one at 90 degrees over here. All right, these are at 90 degrees to each other and the remaining bonds will be with the ammonia molecules, NH3. Remember to draw the N facing the bond and the O facing the bond because these are the atoms that donate their lone pairs from the ligands. Now for the trans isomer, I will keep one water over here and one water up here at 180 degrees separation from each other. That's going to be the trans isomer. And remember, fill in the rest with the ammonia molecule. All right, now remember that this uh, complex over here uh, carries a charge, it's a two positive charge. So in some mark schemes, um, the charge is said to carry some weight, some marks, but some mark schemes uh, forego that altogether, right? It really depends on whether the question says include the charge on the complex in the diagram or not. And in this case, it doesn't, so it's not really needed, but I'm doing it just to be on the safe side. And if I scroll back up, this particular complex is neutral, and so is this, so I don't need to show any charge. But these two complexes carry a two plus charge, so it's better to show it in square brackets with the charge on the top right corner. Moving on to question seven. So we now have some organic chem. All right, step one converts benzene into methyl benzene. All right, this is an alkylation reaction and remember for alkylation, you will always go for a chloroalkane, right? In this case, the methyl group will be bonded to a chlorine, so that's chloromethane, that will be the reagent, CH3Cl. And uh, the condition for this reaction will be a catalyst, specifically AlCl3. You can also go for FeCl3, and uh, in case you don't like chlorine, you could go with um, CH3Br and AlBr3 catalyst. Right. <coughs> so now, at step two, we're going to convert methyl benzene into benzoic acid. So the CH3 is oxidized to this. So for this, you need hot alkaline KMnO4. And that should do it. All right, moving on. So we have methyl benzene and benzoic acid that show five different peaks in the carbon 13 NMR spectrum. All right, now we need to indicate over here which range do those peaks lie in. All right, now if I go back up to methyl benzene. Now over here you have one peak for this particular carbon atom that is going to be in the environment of basically which one will it be? Yes, this is the one. Next to alkene or aryl, right? So if you have a carbon 13 atom 
which is part of an alkyl group but that is next to an arene or in this case a benzene ring simple enough so that will be in the 25 to 50 shift range right because it's only one carbon atom so it's going to be only one peak so we just say that there's going to be one peak in the shift range of 25 to 50 now the other four peaks to make a total of five it's going to be in the range of this environment alkene or airy right so all the other carbon atoms are in the benzene ring and this is going to be the shift range that they are going to lie within all right now just to make sure where these peaks actually are which carbon atoms represent which peaks all right I'm going to color them differently so this carbon atom is in a range of its own now for the other carbon atoms in the benzene ring this carbon atom has its own peak because this is directly bonded to the alkyl side chain these two carbon atoms are one carbon atom away from the alkyl side chain so they belong to the same peak these two carbon atoms are two carbon atoms away from the alkyl side chain so they belong to the same peak as well and finally this one over here has its own peak because it's three carbon atoms away from the alkyl side chain and so if you count the colors you have one two three four five four of them belong to the arene functional group the benzene ring and so they all lie within the 110 to 160 shift range now of course in benzoic acid you're going to follow the same logic all right so you have one peak that is in a shift range of its own that is the one in the carboxylic acid group and then there are going to be four peaks which are in the arene or alkene environment shift range which is again 110 to 160 for the carbon atom in the uh, carboxylic acid group this is the environment that is carboxyl that's going to be 160 to 185 that is the shift range for that one peak all right moving on now we have methyl benzene that can be converted into two uh, isomeric compounds they have the same molecular formula but they will be treated with the same reagent chlorine under different conditions okay so now there's two sets of conditions depending on where the chlorine reacts it could either react to substitute a hydrogen within the methyl group so we could end up with something like this the benzene ring remains as is and the ch3 gets converted into ch2cl right now because it's taking place in the alkyl side chain the substitution so that's going to be a free radical substitution so the condition required for this will be ultraviolet light now if i were to substitute a hydrogen in the benzene ring and not the alkyl side chain then that would be different that would be a halogenation reaction and of course because you already have a methyl side chain bonded to the benzene ring this is going to be position number one and because this ch3 directs to positions two four and six so i'm going to draw a chlorine either at position two or position four and normally the substitution first takes place at position four because it's furthest away from the ch3 so that makes it more stable because of less repulsion between electrons so for this one of course you need alcl3 aluminium chloride catalyst all right now for the benzoic acid it is being treated with different chlorine containing agents under different conditions to make compounds l and m they have different formulas and so that's why we're going to be dealing with them differently all right now over here if i study this c7h5clo2 and i look at benzoic acid 
The molecular formula for benzoic acid, it has six carbon atoms in the benzene ring and the seventh in the carboxylic acid group, so that's C7. One, two, three, four, five, six hydrogens. All right, so there's going to be six hydrogens. And there's going to be uh, two O's in this and one CF. Okay, so there's two O's over here. And over here, what you've essentially done is you've gotten rid of one hydrogen and introduced a chlorine in its place. So that sounds like substitution. All right. And we will go with electrophilic substitution within the benzene ring. Remember that the carboxylic acid group withdraws electrons, so it is 3 and 5 directed. So I will draw it like this. So I have COOH over here. This is number one, so number two, and number three, that is where the chlorine goes. All right. Now for the remaining compound over here, if you notice the difference between molecular formula, benzoic acid, and compound M, what you've done is you have gotten rid of a hydrogen and an oxygen and replaced with a chlorine, right? So essentially what you're doing is you're getting rid of the OH from the carboxylic acid group and replacing with a Cl. So that's going to become an acyl chloride, specifically benzoyl chloride. So this is going to become a benzene ring. And you're going to have COCl over here. And the reagents and conditions to form compound M over here. Um, converting a carboxylic acid to an acyl chloride, you have a number of reagents that you could use. Either you could use PCl3 with heat, or you could use PCl5 or SOCl2. These are the same reagents that you would use to convert um, an alcohol into a chloroalkane, right? Similarly, you can convert a carboxylic acid into an acyl chloride. All right. Question number eight now. We have a monomer lactic acid and we have a polymer polylactic acid that is made of only this monomer, right? Now over here, you can notice you have two functional groups, the alcohol and the carboxylic acid. So the alcohol group of one molecule of lactic acid can react with the carboxylic acid group of another molecule of lactic acid and so the alcohol and acid they get together and what do they make an ester linkage so this is going to be a classic polyester so what i'm going to do is i'm going to place this carbon in the center it is bonded to a hydrogen and it is bonded to a ch3 it is also bonded to the oh and cooh so i will place the oh over here and I will place COOH over here. Now remember that uh, when the esterification process occurs, the carboxylic acid will lose the OH and the alcohol will lose its H and water will be the byproduct. So I'll draw a continuation bond over here. And with this C double bond O, I'm going to copy and paste what I've drawn so far for another residue of lactic acid, the monomer. So this is going to be the same structure that I drew previously. Now I'm going to have a continuation bond because the requirement was two monomer residues. And over here, the methyl groups can be written as CH3, but everything else needs to be fully displayed. That's exactly what I've done over here. The CH3 is not displayed, but everything else is. Now I need to label one repeat unit, okay? So I will start from here and end over here. All right, this is the part that is derived from one lactic acid molecule and that part repeats itself throughout the structure. All right, now the type of polymerization we already discussed, this is condensation polymerization. And the reason why is because we have water as a byproduct. 
Uh, the functional group that we are getting between the monomer molecules is the ester linkage. All right. Is PLA readily biodegradable? The answer is yes. Why? Because the ester linkage can be hydrolyzed. It can be hydrolyzed, it can be broken down in the presence of bacteria, but we just need to write that it can be hydrolyzed, it can be broken down with the help of water. That's why it is biodegradable. Now we have an NMR spectrum of lactic acid shown in CDCL3 solvent, and we have four peaks over here plus the one over here at zero. So what does the question say? Basically, we have to complete this table. All right. We have to mention that according to the proton environments within lactic acid, which chemical shift represents that peak? And what is the name of the splitting pattern? All right. So let's start with COOH. For a proton or hydrogen one, nucleus within the carboxylic acid. This is going to be the shift range, 9 to 13. So let's take a look. Over here we have this peak. All right, that is at a shift value of 12. And uh, because this proton is not bonded to any carbon atom directly, so it will not have any neighboring protons on a neighboring carbon atom. And so that is why it is a singlet. That is the splitting pattern. All right. So chemical shift will be 12.0. Splitting pattern is a singlet. All right. Next, we have the CH that is bonded to three other things. All right. If you look at the structure, this is the CH that they're talking about. All right. Now, notice that it is bonded not just next to an alkyl, which has three protons within it. So that would mean that N equals three and so the splitting pattern has to be a quartet or quadruplet. It's going to be 3 plus 1. N plus 1 rule for the splitting pattern. 3 plus 1 gives us 4. So we have a quartet all the way over here. All right. And the shift value is approximately, I would say, around 4.4. All right. So this is going to be 4.4. This is going to be a quartet, or you could call this a quadruplet. Both words are acceptable. Now, the reason why this is at a shift value of 4.4 is because not only is it bonded next to an alkyl group, it's also bonded next to an electronegative oxygen and next to the C double bond O group in the carboxylic acid, right? So because of being bonded to these groups containing electronegative atoms, uh, the 4.4 is just beyond this range for alkyl next to electronegative atom, right? When you have a proton environment that's bonded to more than one group containing an electronegative atom, the shift value increases. That's to be expected. Now, next one over here is for the OH. Now remember, whenever you have a proton that's part of carboxylic acid or alcohol, it's always going to be a singlet because the proton is not bonded to any carbon atom directly. So the singlet is over here for the OH. It's at a shift value of five. And for the alcohol environment over here, the shift range is 0 0.5 to six. So it lies within that range. It's gonna be 5.0. It's going to be a singlet. And finally, for the CH3, you only have one peak remaining. That's the doublet over here. And it is at a shift value of approximately 1.5. All right. So this is going to be a doublet. The reason why it is a doublet is because if I look back at the structure, the CH3 is bonded next to the CH. So the neighboring carbon atom has one proton, so n plus one equals two, so a doublet. All right, that's how we match the peaks to the environments. Name the substance responsible for the peak at shift zero. Remember that is our standard of comparison. That's going to be tetramethyl silane. All right, or 
we just shorted it to TMS. Explain why CDCL3 is a better solvent than C8Cl3 for use in proton NMR. But the reason is straightforward. C8Cl3 carries a proton, an H1 nucleus, that will show its own peak. You do not want that. You do not want the solvent messing with the proton NMR spectrum of whatever sample we're analyzing. And so we're going to go for CDCL3. So write this down. Basically, CDCL3 will not show any additional peaks, unlike CHCL3. All right. Now, over here, we have la lactic acid again. All right. And it is mixed with a contaminant pentanthrione. All right, so lactic acid and pentanthrione. This mixture is going to be analyzed using gas liquid chromatography. All right, now it says what is meant by retention time. All right, so simple definition that a lot of mark schemes give you is the time from injection of the sample, of the mixture sample that is, of lactic acid and pentanthrione to detection of the component. This detection occurs once the separation has already taken place in the uh, column in this gas liquid chromatography. Now, over here, the mobile phase is going to be an inert gas. You can name an inert gas as well, for example, nitrogen. And the stationary phase will be a non-polar liquid. Maybe you could go with something like hexane, but I think the safer option is to just describe the type of substance that would be a good mobile phase and stationary phase. Now, how do we find out percentage composition of the mixture, as in what percent of the mixture is a particular component, whether it's lactic acid or pentanthrione? What you do is you will calculate the area under the peaks in the chromatogram. Because you get roughly triangular peaks, you will calculate the area. Uh, the area is proportional to the amount of that component in the mixture. So once we do this, then divide area for one component by the sum of areas for all components, then multiply by 100%. All right? So that is how you're going to do it. Area for one component divided by areas for all components times 100. All right, question nine, last question, here we go. So we have diethylamine over here, and we need the reactants and conditions for two different types of reaction that will produce this, all right? So for reaction one, what I'm going to do is I'm going to react ethylamine, CH3, CH2, and H2, with now the other reactant is going to be a halogenoalkane. In this specific case, it's going to be chloroethane, CH3, CH2, Cl. All right. So the reason why I'm doing this is because just like ammonia, amines also go through nucleophilic substitution reactions with halogenoalkanes. So this is a primary amine. This will produce a secondary amine. Right? So when these two react, you need ethanol as your solvent, and you will require heat under pressure for this reaction to be conducted successfully. So 
So these are the reactants and these are the conditions. Next. Now for reaction two, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take an amide. Specifically, I'm going to go for CH3, CO, NH, CH2, CH3. This is basically ethyl ethanamide. All right. Now what happens over here is if I reduce this, the CO will become CH2, all right, and the oxygen will leave as water. And so I will react this with LiAlH4. So this will help produce the amide into the diethylamide that I require. Right. Now the next question is about relative basicities. Okay. So we are comparing diethylamine, phenylamine, and ammonia, okay? So the least basic, you guys should remember, this is phenylamine. And ammonia comes in the middle. And finally, we have diethylamine, that is the most basic. Now the reason or the explanation why is that uh, there are two electron donating alkyl groups, the ethyl groups, in diethylamine, which make the lone pair on the N atom more available bond with a proton or to accept a proton that's right to accept a proton so there are two electron donating alkyl groups in diethylamine all right you have two ethyl groups one on either side of the nitrogen when they donate electrons but they have a positive inductive effect the lone pair of the nitrogen is more willing to accept a proton all right now, why is phenylamine the least basic? Because the lone pair on N overlaps with the delocalized pi bonding ring in phenylamine, making it less available to bond with H plus. All right. So these are the reasons why phenylamine is the least basic and diethylamine is the most basic. Right. Now phenylamine, this reacts with nitrous acid HNO2 at 4 degrees Celsius to form compound P. Uh, now over here, when it is reacting in this way, compound P is just going to be your benzene diazonium chloride. All right. That's an unstable compound that is formed, and this is on the way of forming an organic dye. All right. Now, compound P reacts with phenol. Now, this will be an electrophilic substitution reaction between the benzene diazonium ion and phenol. And this happens under alkaline conditions at 4 degrees Celsius. And so you're going to get an azo compound, Q. All right. So what will happen is you have phenol and the benzene diazonium ion, what happens to it is that you have the benzene ring. Now normally in the benzene diazonium ion you have a nitrogen-nitrogen triple bond, but to get rid of the positive charge on one of the nitrogens, you convert that triple into a double bond. And so the other nitrogen is able to form a bond with the phenol benzene ring. All right, so that is compound Q. We need to circle the azo group, that is the nitrogen nitrogen double bond over here. And uh, an azo compound can be used in dyes. All right, or you could write a specific use for an organic dye like food coloring even though you just have to give one use. All right.
Now over here we have a reaction between diethylamine and this is reacting with an acylchloride, ethanol chloride. And this gives us an amide, all right? And uh, we have been given the reactants, we have been given an intermediate and one of the products. We have to complete the reaction mechanism following all the instructions that are given right here, okay? So this is going to be an addition elimination mechanism, all right? In fact, the next part asks us for the name for this mechanism. Remember, wherever it's an acyl chloride that is involved, it's going to be addition elimination. So the first step is addition of the reactants together, right? So you need to draw a dipole on the carbon-oxygen double bond. Carbon is partial positive. It will attract a lone pair on the nitrogen, so we will draw a curly arrow for that purpose. Now for the carbon to form a bond here, this pi bond between carbon and oxygen will break. The electrons will go from the pi bond to the electronegative oxygen atom. All right. Now you get an intermediate over here. Obviously, when the pi bond broke and both electrons went to the oxygen, you're going to get a negative charge over here, all right? And the nitrogen, which formed a bond with the carbon atom using its own lone pair, will get a positive charge, all right? Because effectively, it has given one electron to the carbon and kept one for itself to form that covalent bond. Right, now you draw a partial positive over here and partial negative over here because it's the carbon-chlorine bond that will be broken because the carbon-oxygen double bond will be reformed the lone pair of the oxygen goes to form the pi bond once again now for the nitrogen to make sure that it is forming no more than three bonds the one hydrogen over here will give up its electrons and give it to the nitrogen so that it is neutralized and the hydrogen escapes as an H+. The Cl over here gets both electrons in the CCl bond, so it'll escape as a Cl-. minus. So H+, plus and Cl-, minus, that will give us the other product, which is HCl. That's the byproduct. That is the elimination step, where HCl is eliminated from the intermediate. All right? And that's it. We are done with the... Uh, A2 Chemistry, uh, October, November 2023, Paper 4, Variant 2. That was a marathon, all right? Easily the longest video I'll be posting on this channel. And uh, be sure you like and subscribe to the channel. And do leave your comments below if you want any other uh, videos to be made in the near future. I'll be solving some more papers in the coming days. So... If you liked it, do share it with your friends as well, and I will see you in the next video.